Thank you to the organizers and, and thank you for Osvaldo for the invitation. Um, so I'm going to tell you a bit about extracellular small RNAs during parasite host communication, but I'll tell you that at the end. So first I'm going to start out with some other stories from the lab. Let's see. So basically this is the three things I'm going to tell you a bit about. A bit about uh, background on microRNA target prediction um, using experimental results. Um, then I'm going to move on to talk about how to improve um, some of these things, especially regarding the, f the prediction of function. And at the end, I'll talk to you about these extracellular small RNAs. So although it's probably not necessary for, for this audience, just a very brief introduction of, of what are microRNAs. So they're very small RNAs, about 22 nucleotides long, that are produced from hairpins, or from larger precursors. Uh, they're present in animals, plants, many viruses that infect these organisms, and a lot of them are highly conserved. They are repressors, post-transcriptional -trans post repressors of gene expression, uh, by binding to complementary sites in transcripts, and we have a large number of them in any particular genome. So uh, currently I think they're above 2,000 uh, annotated in the, in the human genome, and they're estimated uh, to regulate over 50% of all protein coding genes. Yet still, there are relatively few, few of them that we know um, um, as experimentally validated targets. They're also necessary for correct development of plants and animals for those naysayers that do micronase actually have a function. And they have been implicated in different processes such as drought tolerance in plants and cancer in, in humans. So obviously, again, this is something you, you know very well. Uh, they are transcribed in the nucleus to primary transcripts. They're processed into pre microRNA, matured in the cytoplasm, and, and the mature strand of the microRNA, the single stranded uh, mature microRNA, is incorporated to an argonaut protein, and the argonaut is the one that, um, that then binds, guided by the small RNA to, to its targets. Um, given that I come from an institute where a lot of people uh, work on, on plants, it's usually useful to make this distinction, maybe not so much here that microRNAs in plants act in a very different way to, to the way they typically act in animals. So in plants, microRNAs bind to usually fully complementary target sites, and the activity of the microRNA usually involves the direct cleavage of the target. And in animals, uh, microRNAs bind by a very small uh, seed region in the five prime end of the microRNA. Uh, you, so the target site of a microRNA will be six, seven, eight nucleotides long, and that uh, implies that a any particular microRNA will have potentially hundreds of or thousands of targets. And it's very difficult to find out if all of these potential targets are actually doing something. So um, Bikram tomorrow will talk to you about uh, the kind of the state of the art of predicting which of these potential target sites are actually functional. Um, I'm going to talk uh, uh, with a slightly different angle to what we're working on with uh, microRNAs. Um, this is basically involves collaborating with experimentalists who are doing large-scale experiments. So if you work with an organism or cell line or something which is easy or you're, it's, you're capable of doing a knockout for a particular microRNA, obviously given that these are repressors, you would expect that the targets of this uh, microRNA to be upregulated in, in that condition. And this is something that you can measure so that you have an experiment uh, where you are capable of detecting the effects of a microRNA. And these experiments usually involve microarrays or RNA-seq more recently. You have two conditions. You have a knockout and the wild-type condition. You might have an overexpression. You use your favorite technology. And you have a readout at, at the at a genome-wide level. So people who have worked on these experiments, I guess a lot of you have, uh, will know that a lot of uh, any kind of experiment where you're c comparing uh, two different conditions at the genome-wide level uh, will uh, necessarily have a lot of noise in, in, the, in the output, yet you expect that a lot of the upregulated genes in the absence of the microRNA uh, will contain the direct targets for this repressor, and you expect that these direct targets will then have secondary, tertiary effects, so a lot of the other uh, changes that you're detecting are indirect effects of this knockout. So one of the things that we started to work on when I was a postdoc in, in, in Cambridge, uh, working with the first labs that were doing knockouts of microarrays, was my, of knockouts of microRNAs, was to develop methods in which you can uh, evaluate these kind of experiments to see if you really are detecting the direct effects of the microRNA. And this is quite simple from a bio bioinformatic perspective because, again, you know that the microRNA will bind to its targets by this seed region. 
So, and if you know the sequence of the microRNA, you know the sequence of its target site. And then, basically, all you have to do is, okay, these are the upregulated genes in the absence of a microRNA. Um, I expect then for this particular sequence to be overrepresented in, in these genes compared to the rest of the genome. And then basically there's just one little pro problem remaining, which is what cutoff to choose to select those upregulated genes. And this is particularly problematic for regulation when you're studying regulation by microRNAs because they tend to regulate a lot of genes, but each, into each individual gene is, is repressed by a very small amount. So it's not, it's not the traditional um, analysis where you oh, just take all the genes that are at least twofold upregulated and you use some statistics to filter out some noise. But usually a lot of the real uh, changes of microRNAs are 20%, 30% uh, changing the, uh, of the target genes. So we developed an algorithm which was, again, quite simple in, in its idea. And the idea was to not use a cutoff, but uh, um, analyze all the genes. And basically it's this, again, these bars just represent individual genes. You're, reaching, you're measuring all the genes on a genome, and they're just sorted based, this is the most upregulated uh, gene responding to the knockout of a microRNA, and then these are the, the ones that are the next upregulated genes. These genes don't change so much, and these genes are going in the opposite direction. So the algorithm that we developed that we published quite, quite a few years ago now um, is called Silima. And basically, you go down the gene list by a growing window, and at each step, you analyze the frequency of a, any particular word. So this, this represents, let's say, the target site for a particular microRNA. And as you can see in this cartoon, the idea is that for some microRNAs, for some experiments, you will see that the seed uh, binding site of that microRNA will be enriched in one portion, portion of the um, this experiment. And you can quantify this with a hypergeometric statistic. And the algorithm, what it does is essentially you don't, need, you don't need to know what microRNA was affected in the experiment. So you can take any experiment and it will analyze the enrichment of all the potential target sites for all microRNAs and it will quantify if there is a significant effect of any one of them. And just to give you a, a small example, this was um, a set of tissues um, for a mouse which had a knockout for MER22, which is a microRNA which is expressed in many different uh, adult tissues. And although you could uh, expect that if any, in any particular tissue where you know the microRNA to be expressed, if you remove the microRNA from the mouse, you would expect that tissue to present uh, an effect of the direct genes that are now no longer being repressed with that, uh, by that microRNA. What we show here is that the, these profiles are essentially what I was showing you here, these, these uh, plots that imply a significant enrichment in, in the portion of the gene list which you would expect for direct targets. And these, these curves that you, show, you see here, you can see that different tissues, some of them you have these very strong signals which are highly significant, some of them you find very weak uh, signals, and some of them these plots are essentially a random, implying that there's absolutely no enrichment for direct targets in that experiment. And this correlates very nicely when you have uh, actual qPCR measurements of the expression level of the microRNA in these different tissues. So it's pretty obvious that this should be happening. You have tissues in which the microRNA in the wild type is highly expressed. When you remove it, you have a, re a genuine effect of the targets being upregulated. But in you, where you have tissues where even though the microRNA is expressed, it, it's not expressed to a sufficient level that when you remove it, the gene expression changes that you see are really uh, caused by the microRNA. So this is, it's a nice tool to kind of uh, validate which of these experiments you can actually follow up on by looking at which gene changes and actually trying to say something about what the function of the microRNA is based on the genes that are changing. So as a summary of this section, I just want to argue that it's, it's quite, quite difficult to predict the functional microRNA targets in animal genomes due to the small side of the, size of the seed, although Vikram will, will come along tomorrow and say that it's actually, there's a very way, a good way of doing it, and I agree. Um, but this algorithm, um, Silima, allows us to, in, in a slightly more qualitative manner, predict or confirm uh, which microRNA is functional in a particular profiling experiment. So where do we want to go from, from here? 
one of the things that uh, I started to develop when I came back to Mexico was this idea of using these kind of tools to analyze a large set of, of experimental data that is already out there. So uh, people have mentioned before, Array Express and, and Geo, uh, where people deposit their profiling experiments, mostly uh, still uh, microarray experiments are here, but little by little RNA-seq experiments are starting to build up. So this was a certain set of numbers that I pulled down at some point. I guess this has changed quite a lot. But you have several, um, many thousands of experiments of model organisms such as human, mouse, uh, also C. elegans, etc. And the idea of using these kind of tools is that if, it's, if this, this tool can predict when a microRNA is acting, even though the experiment wasn't designed to measure the, the effect of a microRNA, uh, we can potentially discover microRNA signals present in experiments which were designed to study different types of cancer or different diseases, but compare particular cell types or response to drugs, etc. So uh, I'll just show you some of the results that we got from this kind of analysis. So this was a, a pilot experiment in which we analyzed about 15,000 different expression profiles from 10 different species. And we took advantage of the ontology, the annotation of these experiments in an automatic way. So this is essentially just showing you that these experiments are highly biased. Uh, experiments are not designed to be representative of any particular uh, kind of experiment that can be done, but people tend to do experiments which are highly related to cancer, for instance, or different, this, this ontology reflects that uh, different experiments are, 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 are cataloged as being kinds of measurements. So the, the yellow, the yellow um, words, which are not actually so visible here, represent that kind of ontology. So different measurements can be, mean different ages during development, different genotypes, so wild type against knockout of something, different time courses, different doses of different drugs. So those are a lot of the experiments that are deposited. So the sizes of the word represents the number of experiments that are in the data database. And when you do um, bioinformatic analysis uh, on, or any kind of automatic analysis on large sets of data, you have to be very careful of this garbage in, garbage out type of uh, situation. So one of the first controls that we did is, okay, we ran this automatic software on these 15,000 expression profiles, and the program predicts that some of these experiments have a signal of a particular microRNA. So we took those, those uh, profiles, which were around 700 of them, and we said, okay, what is the annotation of these experiments compared to the, the background? And the kind of experiments that are being selected by the program are highly, in, highly indicative that the program is not returning just rubbish. So there are a lot of tissue, uh, so nervous system, brain, uh, liver, muscle, etc. So a lot of, uh, of these tissue-specific experiments. And also uh, developmental stage is another annotation that comes out. And this is very well known to be some of the, the, the classical functions that microarrays have been attributed to, the defining uh, tissue expression profiles uh, during, during evolution. And beyond this very general profile of, okay, microarrays are involved in different tissues, we can then also pull, up, pull out individual microarrays and ask, okay, the experiments that are this particular microarray, MER-124, what, where, where the signal, where the program predicts that this microarray is acting, what kind of experiments are there, and the enrichment is for experiments that have to do with brain, um, MER1 has to do with muscle and heart, MER132 with, with liver, etc. And these also are very well known examples when one can uh, pull them out from the literature of the, these microarrays being highly and specifically expressed in these particular tissues. And of course, there are some microarrays for which there can be then novel predictions as associating them to particular stages in development or particular tissues. So with all this analysis, very global, very qualitative, tying microarrays to particular tissues, um, one of the, the questions that we had is, uh, would this allow us to select a better list of real functional targets by analyzing these, these experiments? And uh, we selected a set of experiments that were already performed in the literature, such as this one, where people had designed an experiment to actually ask what the functional targets of particular microarrays are. So experiments which had actually done knockouts or, or knockdowns or overexpression in different cell lines of microarrays, and basically, by using these as, as a gold standard of what the, the functional targets of a microarray are, we could uh, show that the, 
our, our way of analyzing experiments would narrow down the list of targets in, in, a, in a sensible way. I'm not going to show you these results for lack of time. Um, this was a bit strange because, again, the program is not very sophisticated. It's just looking at enrichment of these small seed sequences. There are, there are many other more com uh, sophisticated computational methods out there. If you, look, you look using conservation or, or different uh, types of context surrounding these, these matches. So we wondered why, why we would be getting, uh, to some extent, better, better predictions. And the most obvious thing that we could think of is that we are using real gene expression data to narrow down the list of targets. So in some way, we, we're using biological context. So then uh, what we decided to try is if we could then, knowing that this seemed to work, could we use uh, this gene expression data in some way to improve a regular target prediction for any microRNA? So basically, this, this was a project that uh, Cesare Ovando, who has a poster today, but not about this, this project, was developing in my lab as a postdoc. And the idea was quite simple again. Uh, let's take the leading target prediction algorithms, such as TargetScan or uh, Diana MicroT. We focus mostly on TargetScan. And is there a way in which we can combine these, these t tools that everybody's using with different profiles from different ex uh, gene expression measurements in a way that we are then able to select a better list of targets when we are interested in the function of microRNA in this particular tissue or in this other different tissue. So this, Cesare uh, used an SVM, a machine learning approach, to combine these sets of, uh, of information. And we recently published a paper showing that, yes, uh, this can be done. It improves the, 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 predict, the, the, the capacity of, of a target prediction method to select uh, genes that are actually expected to respond in, in, an, in an experiment. And we showed that this we can feed it with microarray data, with RNA-seq data, with ribosome profiling expression profiles, and that it was uh, it was uh, the improvement that the method gives is, is beyond just the, the, the simple idea with a, which a lot of people use and which is good of uh, when you, if you're interested in, 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 in a particular microRNA in a particular cell line, well, you take the, your favorite uh, target prediction method, you take target scan, you select the genes that are predicted to be targeted, and then you intersect that list with the genes that are expressed in that cell line taken from any, any experiment. So this is something that people generally do, and it improves uh, the, the target prediction a lot. But our method, which actually uses the gene level, the, the expression level of, of, of all the genes, is, is, is even a bit better. And we, we had different controls. We're, we're using completely independent uh, data from different organisms. So this was from zebrafish. Uh, we can show that you, uh, by training the, the method with uh, the correct microRNA, for the correct tissue, so the pairing correctly the tissue and the microRNA uh, is the way to get the, the best possible um, prediction out of it. And so this is available on a, on a website and as a downloadable tool. So why, why is this important? Um, well, there are many microRNAs that are actually expressed in, in more than one type of cell. So if you just use one computational algorithm to get a list of targets, you will get one list of targets. And this might not be a good picture of what the potentially different functions the microRNA is doing in these different cell types. So we've shown that by adding gene expression data, we can imp improve performance in a general way. But we also uh, feel that the interesting thing about the method is that you can combine the target prediction for one microRNA to different uh, expression profiles of different conditions, and then you can actually start to think about the, the functions that change between different types of cells for that microRNA. Uh, so the, the other thing that, in, in, that we're thinking about improving target prediction methods is to think about the actual genes that are the indirect targets of a microRNA. So again, you, you, you know that the microRNA will affect directly and repress some of the genes. So this is just another cartoon uh, uh, indicating a particular gene expression profile in which the upregulated genes, let's say, in the absence of a microRNA uh, are the ones that are being, when, when the microRNA is present, being repressed by the, the, the microRNA. But of course, if the microRNA represses a transcription factor, and that transcription factor activates a set of genes, or that transcription factor represses a set of genes, then these genes will be tied into the regulation by this microRNA, even though it's an indirect way. So this microRNA will, will appear to be um, 
um, in repressing these genes as well, and this microRNA will appear to be activating these genes through the action of, of uh, intermediate transcription factor. And when we think about this, what is the function of a microRNA? No? If, if the organism is selecting the, the, this regulatory network, then all these genes that are being directly or indirectly regulating, regulated by the microRNA are part of the function of the microRNA. And yet, the target prediction methods will only help you to predict these set of genes, which might even be the minority. So is there a way in which we can predict indirect targets and thus uh, learn a bit more about the function of these genes? So this is the, the, the extreme example of the genes that appear to be activated by the microRNA if you have a, a repressor in, in, in the middle. Um, so how would we go about that? So we, we've just got as far as, as, a, as a preliminary result for this, but it seems to be promising. Um, this was something that, that Roberto Alvarez, when he was a postdoc in my lab, uh, started to develop. So the idea is to use a network approach to predict these indirect targets. And basically what we're doing is uh, building uh, co-expression networks. So you take hundreds, thousands of expression profiles, calculate uh, correlation profiles with some metric between all pairs of genes. So this is a typical example where you have these two orange genes which across many different unrelated experiments are changing in a correlated manner. And then you have this blue gene which is, seems to be anti-correlated or going even in, in the opposite direction. So the idea is that by using this kind of metric to, to drive the connections between all the genes in the genome and build this network, uh, we end up with a situation in which um, the network is built in such a manner that the genes that are highly correlated, directly correlated, will tend to be close together in the network, and the genes which are anti-correlated, going in the completely opposite direction, will tend to be pushed the, as far apart as possible in the network. So then we thought that if we locate the direct targets for any particular microRNA in the network in a certain region, then these uh, genes which at least according to the microRNA will be going in the opposite direction, so these are repressed, these will be activated, then they should be in, in distance par, uh, high, far away in the network. So then this, the problem boils down to locating a certain region in the genome where the direct targets are and then searching for uh, l the longest possible part, path to another part in the network and then predicting that the anti-targets or these genes that will be, tend to be activated in the presence of the microRNA will be enriched in this region of the network. And at least for some examples in which we have the experiments where the microRNA has been knocked out or overexpressed, and thus we can actually measure genes that are being repressed or being apparently activated uh, by the microRNA, uh, we can see that there is a correlation again by, uh, if you start in uh, the portion of the network where the direct targets are enriched, the further away you go in the network, the more significantly enriched, this is the, 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 the enrichment here, the significance of the enrichment, so the far away in the network you go, uh, the, these genes that are being activated tend to be enriched in this portion of the, of the network. So why would this be important? So this is again an example uh, only using experimental data. So we know that this is one of the, probably the most famous microRNAs, it's highly expressed in, in the nervous system, it's highly conserved amongst um, all bilaterian animals. And uh, the direct targets, at least the genes that tend to be measurably repressed by the microRNA according to different experiments, uh, tend to be enriched in, in go terms like things suggesting immune response, response to stress, uh, etc. So if you think about it, this is a highly specific microRNA to nervous system. It makes a lot of sense. There have been some people publishing these kind of things that one of its functions is involved in repressing stress response or immune response in, in a system where this might not be uh, a good idea to activate uh, inflammation and these kind of things. But if we didn't know that this microRNA was expressed in the nervous system, it would only be saying uh, a small part of, of of where of the biology in which it's contributing. So if we, on the other hand, we look at the genes that are measurably detected as being activated in presence of the microRNA, and this is true with cell lines, in, 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 including uh, um, experiments on cell lines, we'll, we will see amongst these genes a lot of terms uh, suggesting neuronal functions, such as cerebral cortex development, synaptic plasticity, um, learning or memory, etc. So 
the, I, I see it as these are kind of two sides of the coin, two sides of the, of the function of the same microRNA. It's important, that, so the regulatory network in which it's connected is important for repressing these kind of functions in the nervous system, and it's important for allowing all th these kind of functions to be expressed there. So as a summary of this part, uh, I would like to say that we can predict the activity of microRNAs from gene expression profiles, even though these expression profiles were not designed to measure the effects of the microRNA with the kind of tools like Silament, which I, I, I talked about in the first part. And using expression data actually adds biological, unsurprisingly adds biological context and can be used to improve the, 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 the characteristics of pure computational predictions. And also we can predict indirect targets using networks. And this, especially the understanding the indirect effects of the microRNA should improve our knowledge about what microRNAs are actually doing or their function. So now finally, I would like to talk about the, a bit about the official um, title of my talk, Extracellular Small RNAs During Parasite Host Communication. And this is, is part of a, a la slightly larger project in collaboration with Amy Buck from the University of Edinburgh and Julie Clay Claycomb from the University of Toronto. It's funded by the HFSP. So th this has, is a subject which has in the recent years become quite popular. Is RNA being used as a communication mole molecule between organisms? So uh, I guess especially for this audience, people might be more aware of extracellular RNAs in, in human bodily flu fluids. People, I, I guess, initially just for curiosity started to sequence um, small RNAs extracted from all sorts of different fluids and found surprisingly that they were there, they were quite stable. So there's a lot of uh, interest in using them as biomarkers now. But anyway, RNA uh, produced inside cells is getting out and it's moving around. So then people started to think about, well, if, if RNA is getting out, can it be used, can it be transmitted between different organisms, maybe between, in a social manner between organisms of the same species, or even between organisms of different species or even different kingdoms. So there have been several papers out there, some of which have um, uh, sustained uh, against time, some of them have been com quite controversial. For instance, there was one in which an experiment uh, indicated that um, plant microRNAs from a diet based on, on, on rice were, were incorporated into the, um, into the bloodstream of mice fed on, on, on these diets and could even uh, end up in the liver of these mice and actually cause gene expression changes. Highly controversial because a lot of uh, people afterwards tried to re uh, reproduce these experiments and were not able to uh, find such an effect. But there are some of them where my individual microRNAs seem to be uh, measurably transferred between parasite, uh, for malaria for instance, or, or viral microRNAs uh, can get into the human body. So there's definitely evidence that, my, that small RNAs, microRNAs are moving around and could potentially be involved in, in interaction between organisms. So the model we're working on for, for this project <coughs> is this um, parasitic nematode, Helicmosomoides polygyrus, or H. poly for, for um, its friends, or well, not friends. Um, so this is a, a gastrointestinal nematode that infects rodents. It's used as a, as a model for, for parasitic nematodes that infect uh, humans. Uh, it's the same clade as C. elegans, and not so far away, evolutionary speaking. And obviously it has, it has co-evolved with the host immune system. So uh, it secretes a lot of uh, factors that modulate the immune system and a lot of immunologists have been studying this for, for a long time. And what Amy found, um, just almost by chance, was that um, in the secretion product, um, which I'll show you uh, right now, there, there is RNA present, and then the question is if this is also participating in, in during this interaction. So there's just a slide showing the, the life cycle which passes through the rodent model. So, and, and it, during the infection, it, it secretes, uh, the nematode secretes certain products which can be collected and analyzed. So what Amy did was uh, extract RNA and from, from the adult worm, from the eggs, etc., and from the secretion product. And the secretion product contains uh, a series of, of microRNAs and other uh, small RNAs which are stably and, and reliably detected there. 
So, so different questions, how are these extracellular RNAs stabilized and if they are, how are they stabilized and do they actually get into host cells? So this is just uh, a northern showing one of these micronase, 100 as a control, and it's an experiment where, first of all, the, 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 the secretion products are treated by RNAs, and they, they seem to be quite stable, but when you treat it with an agent that disrupts membranes, then RNAs actually degrades the RNA. So they seem to be protected by membrane, at least to some extent. And then by looking at in the electro, uh, electron microscope, uh, it seems that the secretion product, again, the figures look quite poor, but there are these tiny vesicles here which seem to be exosomes, or at least extracellular vesicles of some sort. And so these seems to be the, 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 the these extracellular vesicles contain a cargo which includes RNAs, includes microRNAs, and this would be then the way in which the RNAs are stabilized extracellularly, and these the cargo of these vesicles could potentially be uh, uh, delivered to mouse cells. So by using a, a dye, again the photo again is not great, but by uh, using these same vesicles but adding a dye which go, gets in them and then putting these vesicles on, on top of mouse cell lines, uh, Amy was able to show that the content of the vesicles to some extent is actually getting into the cells. And then we can do, for instance, uh, a, a ray expression uh, ex expression arrays of some sort to detect what is the effect of uh, cultivating these cell lines with or without uh, these these vesicles to see what kind of uh, genes are changing and a, lo a lot of the changes are involved actually in the immune response of the type 2 innate immune response. So it seems to be, the, it's, it is well known immunologically that uh, the secretion product does affect, does repress the type 2 innate Im uh, immune response. So one of the, uh, how does this happen? Well, one of, how could how could the RNAs actually be be participating in this in this um, in this process? So one of the interesting things that Amy found was that the vesicles also include an argonaut protein. So not only are, there, are are the small RNAs inside the vesicles, potentially these small RNAs are also already loaded in an argonaut protein. But this argonate protein is a, is a bit strange. So it's not the traditional argonate protein which we know is involved in microRNAs, but it's, it's a worm-specific uh, argonaut. And worms have a bunch of weird things going on. One of the things that they have is they have a ton more argonaut uh, family protein members, members from the argonaut family uh, than uh, mammals, for instance, or vertebrates. And and many of these argonauts actually function in different ways. So they're not all, all involved in, in post-transcriptional gene silencing. Some of them are involved also in, in transcriptional gene silencing. So basically, we have a lot of interesting questions, and we don't have that many answers yet. So for instance, what is the function of the argonaut inside the nematode? We don't yet know. It's, it's an argonaut which seems to have been lost in C. elegans. So Julie uh, in Toronto, part, part of the project involves her. Uh, reintroducing this argonaut into C. elegans to see if uh, we can find out what, what it's doing usually in a nematode. The problem about this H. poly parasitic nematode is that we cannot manipulate it genetically. So that's why we're using C. elegans as a model organism in this case. The other thing is, if this argonaut is getting inside mouse cells, what is it doing? I mean, this is definitely something that is out of context, mammalian cells have never had such a protein inside them, yet potentially this is getting in, so does it have an effect? Uh, and what do the small RNAs, the cargo of, the, of, the, of these vesicles do when they're inside the, the mouse cells? So all in all, are, are we witnessing some sort of RNA-mediated cross-species communication? So when we think about it, we're talking about this kind of, of model in which this protein, this argonaut loaded by the small RNA, is, but from one organism, coming from these extracellular uh, vesicles is interacting with a target that's endogenous to the second organism and then we have some sort of relationship potentially of gene silencing that's uh, a chimera between these two different organisms. So the fir one of the sp first experiments that we did was a very obvious one. So let's take uh, a cell culture for, for these mice cells, let's add to a, a series of these samples, let's add these, these exosomes um, from the worm, and let's see what kind of gene expression changes are going along. So I said, oh yes, we have this very uh, good program that can analyze these kind of experiments and predict what microRNA is, is having an effect. 
So these were the results that we got from using this program. So this is a control transfection in which instead of adding uh, these vesicles, we added a known microRNA uh, for, from, from worm, and so a, a microRNA that is not present in, in mouse, but just an example of one of the microRNAs that could be coming from the worm. And we have these, so this is just a plot, much more complex plot showing different potential seed sequences of different microRNAs that are known to be present in the exosomes. And in gray lines that are just going all over the place are every possible uh, seed sequence uh, for any, any, any potential microRNA. And the ones, these dark blue ones, are the ones of, the, of this control transfection, so it's a positive control, it's working nicely. But when we actually add the exosomes to the cell lines, we get nothing. So this program, although it's, again, it might not be perfect for these kind of experiments, is suggesting no, none of these microRNA seems to be having an effect, even if they are getting into the, um, the mouse cells. So why the negative ex result? So maybe the microRNAs in the exosomes are not entering the, actually the cell, or maybe they are entering, but they're not active because they're not entering in sufficient concentration, or because they're, uh, they're incorporated to this argonaut which is not able to function within um, the mouse cell. The other option is that my program doesn't work for these kind of experiments. So maybe uh, Silamet simply doesn't work when there are too many microRNAs uh, acting simultaneously because the signal from one of them might cancel out with the other one. So we did a, a brief simulation to see if this could be one of the explanations. So we simulated different individual transfections. So basically this involves uh, grabbing a set of genes, selecting a random set of the potential targets and shifting them uh, as little as you would expect uh, for microRNAs to be to repress the direct targets. And the program is very good at, at it's very good at detecting this signal of enrichment of any individual um, transfection of a microRNA. But when you simulate the same effect of adding 15 different microRNAs in one experiment, as expected, then all these signals get diluted quite a lot. Although some of them are more or less detectable, most of the effect is quite diluted. So. Right now, we're, we're thinking about how can we develop better approaches to analyze these complex experiments in which many microRNAs are participating at the same time. The other thing that we started to think about is if there are other players in, 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 this, in this situation, in this model. So in worms, although this doesn't happen in, in, in mammals, there is a, a process which is very important, which is signal amplification. So in, in, in worms, there are secondary sRNAs beyond uh, the primary effect, which could be, the, let's say, the microRNA. So um, it's very well known that if you add, uh, this is the way in which uh, silencing was defined, or RNAi was defined in worms, if you add a, a double-stranded product in worms, uh, the dicer enzymes will chop them up, and these, one of these will be loaded into an agar protein, so these will be the primary um, RNAi molecules. But then you have these uh, RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, which are specific to some clades of organisms, including um, worms and some insects, uh, which then grab th these and, and, and actually um, synthesize secondary sRNAs. And give, given that these RNAs, sorry, sorry, these small RNAs are synthesized by an RNA polymerase, the, the hallmark of them is that instead of having a monophosphate at the fry prime end, which is what you get when you chop uh, a double-stranded RNA, they start by a triphosphate, which is what you get when you start with a polymerase. And these secondary uh, siRNAs get incorporated also to di different kind of argonauts, such as the argonaut which we're finding inside the vesicles. But these are different, okay? So one of the question is, Although we did detect microRNAs inside the vesicles, are these the most important cargo of these vesicles? So you can actually distinguish these small RNAs experimentally. Basically, the standard library um, preparation methods to sequence small RNAs will uh, mainly select, due to the ligase, will mainly select and enrich for these kind of small RNAs, which have a monophosphate at the 5' end. Basically, what you, you, uh, an alternative that you can do is use an enzymatic treatment to remove the triphosphate, to leave a monophosphate, and then the treated RNA can then be uh, prepared in, 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 a, in a similar way to be for sequencing. So in what we call the monophosphate libraries, we detect 
that the majority of the sequences that we're detecting start with a U, which is, again, the usual uh, nucleotide for, for microRNAs. And when we map them to the genome and, do, uh, and annotate where, where they map, this peak of 21, 22 nucleotides coincides quite nicely with what look to be microRNAs. So again, if we just look at these monophosphate libraries of small RNAs from the system, the majority of the cargo seems to be microRNAs. But when we uh, you sequence polyphosphate libraries, these are the libraries which we first treat biophosphatase to remove the, the, the triphosphate, and we sequence the RNAs that we get then, the picture is completely different. So the, the peak of a, of a similar length, around 22, 21, 22, slightly more enriched in, for 22, is um, very highly enriched in sequences that start with a G. And when we map them to the genome, uh, they map to completely different uh, areas of the genome. These are no longer microRNAs, but these are regions which, uh, well, which we are determ determining now to be secondary siRNAs. So this is something that um, we're working on still quite a lot. But as a summary for what I've shown you right now, um, this worm, H. poly, secretes vesicles which, uh, during infection, which contain small RNAs. Um, we need to develop better algorithms at detecting the effect of, of multiple microRNAs acting together. But in this particular case, the majority of these small RNAs actually seem to be, they do not seem to be microRNAs, but they are these secondary 22 gRNAs. And thus, we have no idea if they are doing something within the mouse cells or how to start studying what they could potentially do. But obviously we're working very closely with the experimental um, side of the project to work this out. And with that, I'd just like to say that uh, this project, uh, essentially all of the bioinformatics is being done by uh, a postdoc in my lab, Cesare. Um, and he's uh, presenting a poster, number 16, which is already out there. This is just a a shot of that poster. So if you want to discuss a bit more about the, the project and the results that we're seeing, um, hopefully you'll be um, bothering him tomorrow in the poster session. And with that, I'd just like to thank um, my, the members of my lab, um, the collaborative team for the H-Poly project, which includes uh, Amy and Julie and their postdocs. So Franklin is, is a postdoc in, in Amy's lab and Georgios is also a, a postdoc now in, in Edinburgh, although he mostly worked on, on a new genome build for, for this worm and its annotation. And Tuhin is a postdoc in Julie's lab, so he's doing the work on, uh, on C. elegans using the Argonaut for coming from H-Poly. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you all for the attention, and if you um, have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them, to try to answer them. Thank you.